If you were to multiply two matrices like these ones, then anybody who's taught any linear algebra knows the standard algorithm to do this. But that algorithm is slow. And when these matrices are incredibly large, the slowness becomes a computational problem. So in this video, I want to show you a faster algorithm and tell you the story about the development of the fastest theoretical algorithms possible for multiplying two enormous matrices. Let's briefly review the standard algorithm. If I want to multiply these matrices and I want to look at the entry in the first row and the first column, then I do this weird multiplication of the first row of the first matrix and the first column of the second. These two vectors are multiplied together by something called the dot product, which multiplies the first two components, adds it to the second two components, and adds it to the third components. This gives the value of six. And then we can just step through the matrix doing the same basic process over and over again. It's straightforward, but it is tedious. Now, how many steps did I actually use to do this? Well, this is a three by three matrix, so there's nine different things to compute. And then for each of those nine things, there were three different multiplications and two different additions. So this means there is three times nine, which is 27 or three cube multiplications, but then two times nine or 18 additions. If instead of three by three, I had an n by n matrix that I was multiplying, then the number of multiplications to get any particular entry is just going to be n different multiplications. Multiply that by the n squared number of entries and I get n cubed multiplications that are required. I also get n minus one times n squared additions, but I actually am gonna care a lot less about additions because for really large numbers, computers can do additions actually way faster than they can do multiplication. So from a computational complexity perspective, multiplications are the things I'm really gonna focus on. Okay, so how do I improve on this algorithm? Well, I wanna show you something called the Strassen algorithm. I'm gonna actually do it in the two by two case first. And what I'm gonna do is compute out seven different subcomputations. It's gonna sound like a lot, but I'm gonna compute out these intermediate numbers P1 down to P7. And look, the details don't matter, but what I really wanna focus on is that there are seven multiplications here, and then there's also a whole bunch of additions that are appearing, but mostly it's the seven multiplications that I wanna do. Then it turns out, if you put this particular combination of the P1 down to the P7, you add them up in this particular way, you get the same answer, the same answer for matrix multiplication that you always do. You might not believe me, but let me just do one of these, like the P2 plus P4 that occurs down here. Well, if I expand this out in the definition of P2 and P4, you'll notice that I can cancel a couple of terms, and this leaves me just with exactly what I would have gotten if I multiplied them via the standard algorithm. So it really does work, and you can test them for all the other entries. But what I really want to note is that there's no new multiplications here. The only thing I have is a bunch of new additions there's no new multiplication. So in total, what do I have? Well, I have seven multiplications needed in this algorithm and 18 additions. This is in contrast to the normal algorithm, which has eight multiplications, but only four additions. So what I've sort of done by this weird way of playing around is gone from eight to seven multiplications, but add in a whole bunch of new additions that I have to do. However, I wanna show you how this basic idea can result in a significant improvement in the computational complexity for large matrices. This four by four matrix can really be thought of as four different blocks. And in fact, the four by four matrix can be really thought of as just a two by two matrix, where each of the entries like A is itself a two by two matrix. We call this a block matrix. And this is relevant for our purposes because multiplying block matrices like this works really well. If I multiply two different matrices of the same size, like four by four, for example, then when you multiply the matrices via the normal algorithm, you're basically just doing the normal algorithm, but to these blocks of matrices, you get things like A, E plus B, G, and so forth. You can check the algebra of this if you wish, but the point is multiplication of block matrices of the same size works out really nicely. And that lets us state our theorem. So the claim here is that if I'm gonna be multiplying two n by n matrices together, I wanna think about how many multiplications are truly needed. The claim is that it's n to the log base two of seven of them that are needed. So 
approximately n to the 2.807. This business of the logarithms, well, I, I have some explaining to do for sure, but I want you to note that 2.8 is less than 3, and n cubed was the complexity of the original sort of standard algorithm for multiplying things. And so this theorem really gains us something. Okay, let's see why it might be true. So I'm gonna do a proof by induction, and I'm gonna do a proof by induction on the size of my matrices. I'm actually gonna simplify and assume that my matrices are of size two to the power of k. If they aren't, like if I have a three by three matrix, I can just add in a bunch of zeros, and now this is thought of as a matrix of size two to the power of two in this particular case, and I can do all the same previous work with make it into blocks that I was doing for. Then for the basis, well, that's what we just did. When k is equal to one and is a two by two matrix, and we have just seen that we can, in that scenario, use the Strassen algorithm to have seven multiplications and not eight. Notice that when n is equal to two, two to the logarithm of two of seven, the two to the logarithm of two cancels and you just get seven. I'm gonna assume it's true for the k minus one step and I'm going to prove that it is true for the kth step. And the basic way I'm gonna prove this is I'm gonna use the Strassen algorithm on the block matrices. So what I'm gonna basically do is just assume that this is just multiplication of two by two matrices, where each entry in the matrix is itself a two to the k minus one by two to the k minus one matrix. I'm gonna use the Strassen algorithm again, and I know that for this, it only takes seven multiplications. But then within each block, I get to use my induction hypothesis. I know that it takes seven to the k minus one multiplications in each individual block. And so, well, what do I get? Seven times seven to the k minus one, this is just the same thing as seven to the k. Since I know that n is two to the k, I can take log base two of both sides and replace the k with log base two of n. And then the final step is just using some log rules where you can always take the base of an exponent and the argument side of the logarithm and you can swap those around. So that's what I've done to get n to the logarithm base two of seven. By the way, as a fun exercise, you can figure out how many additions are needed and do a pretty similar induction for that. I'll leave that as an exercise. Okay, so where are we in our story so far? If I use the original algorithm, it's gonna give me that there's n cubed total multiplications that are needed. Then Strassen came along in 1969 and showed us that we can do better than n cubed. We can do n to the 2.807, or more generally, log base two of seven. This started a whole process of people trying to do better and better and better. The first one came really in 1981 by a new technique called the laser method, Basically, this method translates this multiplication complexity problem into some other problem to do with tensors, and I'm not gonna go into it in this video, but I'm gonna leave a bunch of links down in the description. And basically, you can use this method and try to answer the problem to do with tensors and cast it back to answer the problem to do with multiplication. That gave a better estimate as well, and these people went on and on and on doing better and better versions of this laser method until 2020, when Allman and Williams managed to get that is currently the best number, 2.37, I had to look at my screen to remember what that was. Actually, Williams is kind of cool because she had previously been the record holder, she got beaten, and then she beat her own result again, so back on the, on the top of the crown of fast matrix multiplications. These numbers might look like small improvements, but remember that when we're talking about vast matrices and large amounts of computational time needed to them, even a small change in this exponent can make a really big difference. So, like, what's the fastest that this could get to? Well, theoretically, the, the, the absolute limit would be n squared. This is just because there's n squared entries. There's n squared things that you have to compute. So that's the absolute sort of minimum bound. The sense I get from the, the sense I get from the literature and from the statements from the people who are involved in this sort of active research is that at least the current tools aren't expected to get some big jump to get to the value of n squared, but that somehow is the theoretical minimum. Determining this sort of best possible value in the asymptotic limit as the matrices get really large is one direction for this kind of research, but there's actually more. For example, in this brand new paper by Fozzi et al., they actually use machine learning called alpha tensor related to the alpha zero that dominates in chess. And they don't try to improve on the asymptotic limit. 
They instead look at smaller matrices and see whether there are actually more efficient algorithms than that original Strassen one that I showed you in this video. They have an improvement on it that works for 4x4 matrices. Regardless, the story of multiplying matrices as efficiently as possible with a couple different interpretations of what efficiently means is certainly far from over. It's an avenue of active research today. Now, to truly understand an algorithm, or mathematics more generally, it really helps to be actively engaged in the learning process. This is Brilliant.org, which is the sponsor of today's video, and their lessons are incredibly interactive. I mentioned in this video about using AI to help find better algorithms, and, and that can seem crazy advanced, but with Brilliant, you can actually play around with the foundational concept of things like neural networks, or any of the thousands of lessons about math and science and computer science that they have. Brilliant puts you in the driver's seat, whether that's implementing an algorithm, playing around with an animation, or testing your knowledge and getting detailed feedback about it. As a math professor, I know that this kind of active learning approach that Brilliant uses is really effective for your learning, and that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet, sign up for free, and the first 200 people to use that link down in the description will get an additional 20% off. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.